Wide complex tachycardia is a general term that broadly denotes the presence of ventricular tachycardia, VT, or supraventricular wide complex tachycardia. It is a general term used to describe cardiac rhythms with a rapid ventricular rate, such as one with 100 beats per minute or faster, and prolonged QRS duration, so 120 milliseconds or longer. As such, clinicians who encounter patients with wide complex tachycardias must consider a broad variety of attributable causes, including ventricular tachycardia, supraventricular wide complex tachycardia with a pre existing or functional aberrancy, supraventricular wide complex tachycardia developing from an impulse propagation using an accessory pathway, such as pre excitation, whether it's a rapid ventricular pacing rhythm, or tachyarrhythmia coinciding with toxic metabolic QRS duration widening, such as in hyperkalemia or an antiarrhythmic drug toxicity. Now among these, ventricular tachycardia is the important one. This accounts for about 80% of wide complex tachycardias sampled from patients evaluated in the electrophysiology lab. However, the prevalence of these wide complex tachycardia etiologies varies considerably in the population study. As such, we don't really have a true incidence of ventricular tachycardia among these wide complex arrhythmias in the real clinical setting, okay? and only a few retrospective studies have actually attempted to broadly examine them. So how do we define them? We said they are wide complex tachycardia equals a QRS duration of at least 120 milliseconds and a rate, a ventricular rate of 100 beats per minute. So when we mean the QRS duration, we're looking at the QRS complex in the interval. Here's your QRS complex in the interval from beginning to end. Okay, so normally uh, it's between 70 and 110 milliseconds, but once you hit that 120 milliseconds, okay, so greater than or equal to 120 milliseconds, or three small boxes in wide, we consider that wide. And the other component is having a ventricular rate of at least 100 beats per minute, okay? So what you can see down here is a narrow complex uh, tachycardia, okay? So these QRS complexes here are within normal limits, and below it is the Y complex, okay? The rate is clearly above it, close to maybe 150 uh, in this case, maybe a little faster than that here, but this is a regular wide complex tachycardia. And the issue is we have to differentiate whether this is a ventricular tachycardia, we said that's the most common one, and we'll see that's the most lethal one, versus a supraventricular wide complex tachycardia, which is, tends to be more benign, okay? So the critical task that we have as clinicians is to determine whether this wide complex tachyarrhythmia has a ventricular or a supraventricular origin, okay? So that's the key thing, ventricular versus supraventricular, okay? And we'll see why that's the case. So what do we mean by that? Well, ventricular, here's your right ventricle and left ventricle. So is it originating from somewhere down below? So as in a ventricular tachycardia, or it does it as a supraventricular above the ventricle origin, okay? Which tends to be more benign. Now, accurate discrimination of VT and a supraventricular wide complex tachycardia is is incredibly vital. It impacts immediate patient care decisions, ensuing clinical workup, and long-term management strategies for our patients. For instance, patients who present with ventricular tachycardia deserve a prompt and accurate diagnosis. Without question, VT is a commonly life-threatening problem which requires rapid diagnostic and therapeutic interventions. Now, in the case of pulseless ventricular tachycardia, it's immediate recognition followed by prompt external uh, defibrillation and antiarrhythmic drug initiation can actually be life-saving to those patients. In addition, attributable precipitant etiologies of VT, whether it's myocardial ischemia, must strongly be considered, especially since the therapeutic approach may be urgent coronary vascularization. Okay, so we may actually have to revascularize some of these patients in that setting. In other circumstances, VT may be triggered or exacerbated by electrolyte imbalances or hemodynamic disturbances, both of which require treatment. Now, in the absence of reversible VT precipitants, more invasive management options may be pursued, including VT ablation. Now, in contrast, with, when you're dealing with more of a supraventricular wide complex tachycardia, these are generally demonstrated more benign clinical course. In rare circumstances, they can have hemodynamic compromises. However, most of them are well tolerated and do not require urgent electrical cardioversion, and therefore can be properly addressed through judicious non 
pharmacological uh, or pharmacological approaches, such as beta blockers or amiodarone as medications or even a Valsalva maneuver can sometimes help. Now, rarely invasive ablative options are needed in the acute setting. The hazard of inappropriately treating VT as a supraventricular wide complex tachycardia and vice versa should not be understood estimated. Okay, this is very important. The dreaded misdiagnosis of, of an actual VT as a supraventricular wide complex tachycardia can unintentionally expose patients to harmful pharmacological therapies such as calcium channel blockers that can lead to severe clinical consequences and even death. For such reasons, undifferentiated wide complex tachycardias, especially those presented with hemodynamic instability, are often presumed to be VT until proven otherwise. Conversely, an inaccurate VT diagnosis for an actual supraventricular wide complex tachycardia may introduce its own unique problems. In the immediate sense, this diagnostic error is not discernibly dangerous, but it may inauspiciously lead to unwanted cascade of downstream effects. For instance, an unintentional incorrect VT diagnosis may cause inappropriate and potentially injurious myocardial treatments such as uh, antiarrhythmic medications or even procedural interventions such as an ICD, okay, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator okay, in these patients. Furthermore, in contrast to VT diagnoses, a large proportion of the supraventricular wide complex tachycardias, such as AFib or A-flutter, normally prompt the initiation of long-term anticoagulation therapy to reduce the associated risk of devastating thromboembolic events, such as stroke. Therefore, proper patient management heavily relies on whether the clinicians are equipped with and appropriately apply effective and reliably means to distinguish these wide complex tachycardias. Although arriving at the correct diagnosis by way of 12 lead EKG interpretation is often challenging. Following decades of rigorous research since beginning in the 1960s, the quest for an effective, simplified, and practical means to non-invasively differentiate these wide complex tachycardias has brought forth a number, an arsenal of manually ECG interpretation criteria and algorithms that we have. Each has proved its own diagnostic value in the controlled research setting, that is, although each differentiation method possesses its own shortcomings. And perhaps one of the most emblematic limitations of these approaches is that their diagnostic performance inextricably relies upon the clinician's precise execution of the prescribed manual approach. And this is often difficult for even the most experienced electrocardiographers. Unfortunately, since it's not feasible to prospectively actually evaluate these diagnostic performance of these algorithms, this limitation has yet to fully be defined by evidentiary means. Therefore, we can only hope that the diagnostic efficacy of the manually uh, applied EKG approaches that we use today are actually okay and able to be generalized to a real-world clinical practice. Now, recent research and some of the research that we're doing has shown that accurate wide complex differentiation may be even accomplished by automated means, okay, that we can use computerized ECG interpretation software to accurately and automatically interpret or provide a VT probability for which diagnosis it is. Now, in upcoming lectures, we'll take a deep dive into the traditional and contemporary methods used to differentiate wide complex tachycardias. And in doing so, we're going to review the hallmark EKG characteristics that are used to differentiate both ventricular tachycardia and a supraventricular complex, uh, wide complex tachycardia. And so that will help you when you get an EKG in front of you. We'll also examine the conceptual and structural design behind these differentiation methods. We'll highlight practical limitations of these manually applied EKG interpretation approaches that we're using and then we'll discuss recently devised and put together future methods designed to accurately and automatically differentiate wide complex tachycardia. This is undeniably one of the most difficult topics in electrocardiography so let's tackle this together.
Before we end, let's discuss what or let's review what we discussed here. So wide complex tachycardias are either VT or have a supraventricular wide complex origin, okay? And that's a really the hallmark of what we're trying to do. Is it originating from above here or is it within the ventricles? We said that we define them by having a cure restoration that's prolonged to so at least 120 milliseconds and a rate of at least 100 beats per minute. The critical task we said, where is the origin, okay? Ventricular or supraventricular? We had a number of differential diagnoses that these wide complex tachycardias can exist and present themselves as. And it's really important to know the main thing is VT versus all the rest, okay? And why that is really important because these accurate wide complex differentiation impacts patient care, how we actually treat the patient in the immediate setting and how their maybe long-term management is set up. So accurately distinguishing these is often still challenging on the EKG, okay, despite so many criteria and algorithms that have been proposed over the years, okay, will help and start to assess what these hallmark, hallmark criteria are as we go through, especially those that represent VT, you'll see those, and how to not miss those ones, okay? So that's the main thing. But we'll also show the limitations that exist with these. And then the future, okay? What does the future hold of using automated methods and maybe the approach of artificial intelligence to help us distinguish these wide complex tachycardias? Well, that's the end of this lecture. We discussed what wide complex tachycardias are, how they vary, and the importance of accurately differentiating them. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here, over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos, and this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter. Okay, so completely separate from what you're getting online for free. Okay, these are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book, okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there, okay? We'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use, uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows, uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there, very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic and editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and you know, still struggling. So 
uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them. Okay, you can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough. Okay, and you find yourself using other resources, which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right, have a great day.